Once again, my name is Miguel Pinabella, and I'm joined by rapper and director Boots Riley. Welcome, Boots. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm really great. Um, we're very delighted to have you. Um, so I think we'll just get started um, with our discussion. Uh, watching this film, Sorry to Bother You, is really interesting in 2020, especially just days before this coming election. But you actually wrote this movie back in 2012, around the time of Occupy Wall Street. I wonder if you could reflect on the changes since then and how our understanding of the film might be different now versus back in 2012. Okay, well, now it's time for me to admit something because when I was promoting the movie, I often said that I wrote it in 2012. And that was a bit of a weird thing where I was worried that millennials and Gen Zers would worry that it was, would, would think of a later date as too old. But I actually started writing it in 2010 and um, it took that long to get it made and, and for me to get it right, actually. Um, and so what are the, I'm sorry, uh, I got hung up on that. And what, what are you saying? What are, what are, what's the question? What are the differences? Or can you just reflect on the changes since you wrote it back in 2010 um, yeah. versus how we see it well, now? So, you know, unfortunately, this film is not irrelevant. You, you know, for all of my work, I always hope that um, it can be, that a movement could make it irrelevant. Um, however, what it's talking about, it, you know, it, it, it gets at what the, the main contradiction of capitalism is, which is the exploitation of labor. It talks about a lot of things, but because it talks about it from that standpoint, um, it ends up, you know, it's going to be relevant as long as we have capitalism. And um, I think some of the differences between now and then is, um, I, I, I think um, maybe before Occupy Wall Street, which is when I wrote that, um, the news was going through a period where it wasn't showing um, radical direct action as much it was happening, but it wasn't being shown. And obviously once Occupy Wall Street happened in 2011, 2012, it, it grew. Um, now I will say this, that um, what also is different is that um, there is now this massive movement like th that had, hasn't been around for decades. In um, you know, when we think of movements that were thought of as big in the United States, we often talk about the civil rights movement as being the thing that, you know, the 60s, what we need to be like. Well, in the civil rights movement, for instance, there was the March on Washington, one of the biggest marches, 200,000 people only, right? right? Compare that to we've had during the anti-war movement of the early 2000s, and uh, if you add up everything that was happening with like at Occupy Oakland, we did a, a thing that had 50,000 people at that, if you just talk about one thing. So um, the movement is way bigger than those times that were seen as historically, uh, you know, uh, shifting the current, right? So we're in the middle of that right now. and. It was very odd. It be, has become very obvious to many people because we saw during the Black Lives Matter thing, we saw um, every town and every city had Black Lives Matter protests. Even ones that were all white um, had Black Lives Matter protests, and 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 so these are things that are affecting masses of people, millions of people that are getting involved in things. Along with that, since March 15th, in the United States, there has been 900 strikes. Mm -hmm. That's something that isn't getting covered. We had a strike wave in April where there was 300 strikes in April. And some of these strikes were radical, like had radical demands, like you had the GE workers that demanded to stop making, uh, to, to stop making jet engines and went on strike demanding to make ventilators instead, right? So we have this thing happening. Now, um, so that's the, the, the big difference is that 
when I was writing it, it was in hopes of massive upheaval and things like that. Uh, and, and, and people realizing that they have to, to uh, you know, take the system into their own hands. And that, I also was even writing it with the hope that people could direct some of that energy into withholding labor to make things happen. And so in a great uh, roundabout uh, that happened with the film is during that strike wave in, the, in April, I was getting dozens of messages of people saying, a lot of people at our job site didn't want to go on strike. We had everybody watch Sorry to Bother You, and then they were down. So, um, so I think that's, that's some of the differences. But I think the, the reason why it's relevant is that I, I'm, as I was writing it, I had a, an analysis of the system that um, is a class analysis that um, allows me to, um, to talk about material conflicts that exist and, and we're not getting rid of those material conflicts until we get rid of capitalism. Yeah, and that actually leads pretty well into my next question, which I think you actually um, answer a bit of, which was that, you know, this series is centered around the idea of subversives and I considered this movie you know, quite ideologically subversive because rarely do we actually see Marxist anti-capitalist politics in, you know, a commercially released movie. I mean, how important was it for you to place these ideas front and center? Well, I just, uh, I, you know, it, it, there's no other reason for me to do, the, do art at all. Like, I, I think people, ha you know, if you're gonna be an artist, you have to be passionate about something other than art, right? Like I wouldn't be doing art if I wasn't passionate about something. I just, I don't, I don't want to just hear myself rap. I don't want to just make something and then I figure out what it is that I want to make. I have things that I really want to say and I can get more people to, to pay attention to those things if I communicate that through art. And I can also uh, communicate it maybe more, I can communicate it better through art, like in the sense that, you know, art is the words between the words, the, the emotions, that, the colors that you can't get to. And um, so, I, you know, uh, it was very important because I mean, it's my only reason for being actually. So, I mean, and, and I, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I'm a communist and um, sometimes, and, and I, I shy away from just being like, I'm a Marxist and putting Marxist thought because it's real easy to get a job saying you're a Marxist because it kind of means just an analysis of what's happening. But if you say you're a communist, it means you want, you are wanting to actively participate in getting rid of this system, right? And, um, you know, and, and so that's like what my art is trying to do. I'm trying to do something that, I, I, I'm hoping to make art that can be used by organizers to um, make their campaigns more effective. And, but I can't do that just straight mechanically like, because then you make bad art. I have to start with my own emotions, my own feelings, my own uh, just uh, thoughts about existence. And if I'm really true to those things and true to everything I think about the world, then I'm going to be able to draw a line between my thoughts about existence and how I think the world should be, right? And in that line is a story. Right. I mean, can you talk more about your background as an activist? How did, what did that look like and how did that shape the content of the film? Um, so let's see, when I was 14, um, I started helping uh, to an organize, a, a youth organizer came by my house and um, said, hey, 
I got there, you want to go with us to the beach? And it was a van full of 14 year old girls. And I was like, yes, of course, I want to go with you to the beach. And he was like, well, but first we're going to go to the Watsonville cannery workers strike and support that. And so I started coming around that and I was helping support the Watsonville cannery workers strike, uh, then went and helped organized farm workers in the Central California Valley and was had joined a radical party um, by the time I was 15 and um, got involved in doing some on at school agitation and kind of got put in this position where due to this student strike that we led, um, I was going around the country speaking. And so I was kind of put in a position of leadership, even though I definitely was not ready for it, but then you, you end up having to get ready. And, um, but because of the work with uh, farm workers in the Central California Valley, I knew about Teatro Campesino. And so I'd always hear about that. And my grandmother had been the uh, director of the Oakland Ensemble Theater in the 70s and 80s. So I kind of came back from that thinking like, how could I use theater to put, uh, to, to uh, you know, put these ideas out there. And um, at that same time, uh, Spike Lee had do the right thing come out. So I was like, that's how I'm gonna do it. And I went to school at San Francisco State. But during that whole time, I was part of, uh, you know, the Progressive Labor Party and the International Committee Against Racism. And um, then I left, the, by the time I was 19, I was a burnt out organizer at the, at the ripe old age of 19. And so uh, me and some friends created a different organization of artists that used to be in political organizations that were like, we're just gonna be artists now. We're just making culture. And this was called the Mau Mau Rhythm Collective. And, um, but as that group, we would throw these shows called hip hop edutainment concerts. And we talk about, a, we, every show would talk about one subject and we'd have people come on, whoever wants to perform could, but you're only doing one song and you're talking about this subject in it. And, um, but it grew, it grew to like 500 people at one point. And then some of the high school students that had now joined were like, well, what, what is this? How are we just going to be talking about politics? I mean, how are we going to talk about politics in our music if we're not doing it, anything? So our, us folks that had started it trying to run away from organizing were pushed into the position by younger folks who were right, that were like saying, we got to connect this music with campaigns. And so we ended up connecting it with one, the Women's Economic Agenda Project, which at the time were defending uh, women who were uh, being uh, attacked uh, under welfare, welfare fraud laws. And we were um, handling, handling police brutality cases. Um, Anyway, we got into all of these things. Uh, the, the international campaign to free Geronimo Gijaga Pratt, um, a, a bunch of stuff. And so that, that started melding the art and the politics together. And then by the time I was 24, um, I had a midlife crisis where I was like, I've been an artist all these times. We put out two albums. And so, um, and I decided to quit doing music at that time. And we started a different organization because Mau Mau Rhythm Collective had broken up. So we started a different organization called the Young Comrades, which was a group of all black folks who were organizing specifically in the black community, but with a class analysis to what we were doing, right? And um, so um, again, that was, and that was one where it again was most of the people were artists, but at this time was specifically not a cultural organization. Um, and um, we headed up a bunch of campaigns. Um, one was a, uh, anyway, I don't wanna get all into those details. We headed up a bunch of campaigns. Then that, as many organizations do, ended up 
fighting each other and breaking apart. And it kind of became a study group. And at that point, I was like, if it, we're just going to be a study group, you know, I can get the ideas out in a bigger way. And then I went back and did steal this album which the musicians on it, a lot of them were folks that were in uh, The Young Comrades. So. Yeah, yeah, I was really interested too in the movie because you briefly brought up um, uh, the issues of race, both in your music and in your activism work and in your film. Um, I was interested in those intersections in Sorry to Bother You between race and capitalism. So what were your ideas behind those themes? Well, um, Capitalism needs racism in order to exist, right? It, you know, um, from the beginning, it was, you know, the, the idea of race, uh, and I, because I know a lot of, I'll be speaking to the choir, so I'm just to get to where I am, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it short, which is the idea of race was, the theory was created in order to justify uh, chattel slavery of African people. And, um, you know, and they needed to say to the white working class, look, we're not gonna do this to you. This is a whole different species of people at the time, race meant species. And this is a whole different, we, we wouldn't do that to you humans. We're gonna do this to these folks because this is what uh, needs to be done. And that's when the, the theory of race started coming out, like before that, people did describe each other, oh, those are dark people, those are people that look like this or whatever. But there was no idea of pe different nations of people, and, and, and they would talk about nations at that time, but there was no idea of different nations of people being one race. There was no idea that French people were the same as British people um, because they were white, right? So in a way, the idea of whiteness came about in order to in order to say, you are a different group of people. We're not going to do this to you. Now, it has to. It, it's it is um, also part and parcel of what is existing today for that same for some of the same reasoning, which is um, so. For instance, I always give the, 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 when when uh, when the, we're, they're having the discussion of uh, the white voice, and Danny Glover's character kind of describes his idea of whiteness. What it what it is reflecting off of is that there's an idea of whiteness that's an opposite of blackness, right? And it's not that, as I explain in the film, it's as he explains in the film, it's not that there's a such thing as either one. It's just, there's an idea that people are uh, adhering to. And, um, but the, and the, that opposite of blackness is this idea that comes from this, which is, uh, and, and they have to have these ideas because of this. First, um, capitalism must have unemployment in order to exist. If you have full if you have full employment, then um, anyone could demand whatever they want for a wage because you can't fire anybody, you can't replace them because everybody's already employed, right? So um, even though we know that under capitalism we would never get to that point, we'll see places like Wall Street Journal and Financial Times publicly, openly worry about the unemployment rate going too low because wages go up in real time as unemployment goes down, right? You have to have this group of unemployed people in order for it to work. Now, if you have a group of unemployed people, that means you have a group of unemployed people who wanna eat. They're not gonna let themselves starve. They, get in, they are going to get involved in illegal business. Now, illegal business uh, you know, operates in the same way that legal business operates. Legal business and illegal business, legal and illegal business both use violence to regulate themselves, right? Like you, you see Santa Barbara, uh, you know, uh, can stop a hotel from building a golf course through it because uh, they can say, hey, we've got this deed. We own the land. You can't build a golf course through it. Now that deed means nothing without the dudes with guns and uniforms coming to back it up 
Similarly, with illegal business, there's uh, there's violence that has to happen or the threat of violence in order to regulate business um, for, for illegal business. And this is where the effects of poverty come in, the violence that surrounds poverty the, and just the poverty itself. But how do they explain that to folks, right? How do they explain that to the whole working class that poverty is built into capitalism? Well, you, and, and that, and, well, they don't. They say this poverty it exists because those people that are impoverished are lacking education, they're lacking culture, they're lacking, um, you know, they're savage, they're this or that, you know. And so in that way, they're able to say to the whole working class, look, those folks down below, they're only that way because they're, they're culture. And the, the, all the racist stereotypes that you could figure out. And that, and, and, um, in this way, this idea of what whiteness is ends up making folks that actually are poor, that might be a white guy making 22,000 a year, claiming that he's middle class because he says, I'm not them, right? I'm, and, and allies more with the system and the ruling class. Um, and so in this way, these racist tropes are needed in order to keep the system alive. So there is no way to, the, the race and class are inextricably intertwined, right? And so you can't get rid of capitalism without fighting racism because you're not gonna be able to build the movement that you need in order to get rid of racism. And you can't get rid of racism without getting rid of capitalism because it will keep generating because there's an economic need for it by the ruling right. class. One of the other big um, points of critique in the movie are Silicon Valley tech companies, which you really set your aim at. Uh, you have Regal View and Worry Free who are the fictional companies at the heart of the movie. And they're working together to offer what's essentially wage slavery. How did those, how did real life tech companies influence the story and your critique? Well, so that's something that I've seen written a lot, that it was the tech, tech companies that inspired it. I mean, in the movie, it's not a tech company. They're producing things, right? Right. And so it seems like tech companies because that's what, that's the new speak that we hear more like. This is not a workplace. This is a beanbag room that we play in and I tell you what to do it, right? We, we see examples of that, but that's what's going on everywhere. If you work at Target, they're telling you the same thing. You're a team member, right? If you, you know, like that's capitalism. It's not just, it's not relegated to the tech world. Um, I think that that a lot of writers are more keyed into the tech world so um they've they've talked about that but it's it's really corporations themselves and um trying to paint themselves in a new way right we, 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 and and we see that because uh tech companies are like made to be superstars so we see the the heads of those companies more right and and they're trying to make themselves seem cool. Like, hey, I'm just like you. I'm wearing the red t-shirt, just like boots or whatever. And, you know, I skateboard, you know, all that kind of, thing, right? But, you know, uh, moguls have tried to remake themselves all the time. You got, you had like the, the everyman mogul, Howard Hughes, like, you know, he's rough and tumble and he just is making and doing all that kind of, you know, we, we, this is not new. This is not new. This is just, ha this just happens to be the style right now. Right. So, um, and uh, yeah, so, I mean, it, it wasn't sp specifically a cr critique of, of uh, tech companies, but those are just the ones that are in the spotlight more. Hmm. But yeah. I've, I've been part of uh, 
you know, like everything from, I used to work for a sweater folding company, which was weird. Like, I don't know what it was like REI or so it was back behind REI. So I don't know if it was related, but I just remember it was like a husband and wife owned it, but it was a big company, a big warehouse. And they, <laughs> they would come in and talk about how we were a family and like, they see us as their kids and all kind of crazy stuff. So it's, it's not new. I, it's just, I'm, I'm just pointing it out in ways that are becoming more clear to folks right now. Right. Yeah. One of the, one of the big kind of plot points in the movie, obviously is when cash green crosses the picket line. Right. And it's this kind of moment of tension between him and his friends, because it seems like the company would rather have those workers competing against each other rather than organizing as a labor union. How does corporate culture turn workers against each other? Well, it obscures, it obscures the fact, first what they do is they obscure the fact that the main way that their company is making money is by people producing something and that making wealth and them taking the lion's share of that. They obscure that fact and one way that they're able to do that is to individualize everything, right? Is to make it seem like, you know, everybody's just kind of in this for themselves and the best rise to the top, but they're not thinking of it as just individual, right? They're thinking of it as how is this whole group of people going to all together produce the thing that we need, you know, at the level that, so, the obscuring and personalizing of the the idea that capitalism runs on exploitation of labor um and um and 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 i will say this when we think of it as corporate culture we think about that culture as existing at on the job site but it really is being fed to us every day by the things we watch and the way things are talked about on the news, and, and, you know, and by things we watch, I mean movies, TV, everything. Um, and, and so um, corporate culture doesn't need to do a whole lot. You know, it's, it's feeding off of what's already out there. Um, but, you know, and, and so then they obscure, because of that obscuring of the uh, nature of the economic relationship there, they're also obscuring the nature of the folks that run the company and what they're there to do. And so by obscuring that, you know, it, it, it makes it seem like it's not as, uh, you know, it makes it seem like not necessarily a logical thing to organize. Like if we're all family, maybe we could all work together and all figure it out together. And maybe the manager needs to be here. So, um, I've heard about something that happened at one of the big tech companies like last year where the workers, a big one, and, and the workers were all like, you know, organizing and doing rolling strikes and stuff like that. It got a little bit of coverage and it didn't, but um, they were about to make a union and somehow one of the managers was able to get enough people to uh, be down with him being in the union meetings. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, that was one of the things that made it not happen, right? But, but because there were enough people that had bought into the culture of what was happening there that they didn't see the line. And it, probably the thing is, he was a personable dude, right? To where, you know, people are like, well, you know, they're not all that bad. They, they you know, it's not like, you know, you know, a slave driver or whatever. And, you know, like, so, um, yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, so you briefly mentioned this, this uh, kind of the role of pop culture. And in the film, pop culture is depicted as oftentimes mindless distractions, like the game show kicked out of me. Um, what is the relationship between pop culture and capitalism in the film? And is, how do you see it operating in the real world? Well, um, how I have it happening in the film, and obviously it's only selecting a slice of what pop culture does, which is sometimes it, you know, 
people are get so used to um, the degrading nature and they get or they get used to a thought process about human beings that it allows for the accepting of other things. So in that case, obviously, you know, it's um, the humiliation of uh, someone is just seen as a sport, right? And this, the subjugation of someone is just seen as a sport. And it's part of what they're selling with the idea of with people being okay with folks, you know, being slaves, right? So that's, con they're, they're connected there. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of what I had happen in it was in that case, um, the, the they were able to flip use that subject use that that um humiliation that was part of pop culture and when Cassius got hit in the head by a by a can it was spread around because of that but ended up kind of flipping the the idea of why they should be against him right to, as far as for the viewer so right. the viewer ended up um that on, in the movie, the viewer ended up seeing that and being like, we're su supposed to be laughing at him and he's on that other side. So now we're on the side of the strikers. And it's to a certain extent what, um, I don't know what artists or skilled propagandists might do, right? And um, so, so yeah, the, uh, you know, I think a lot of pop culture is supposedly telling us how things are and getting us used to how things are as opposed to thinking it should could ever change um uh uh i recently a couple years ago started reading some of the mark fisher stuff um k-pop and he talks about how um you know in pop culture well first of all you can you know, you can imagine anything happening except for people changing the system. You can imagine the whole world getting wiped out. You can imagine, you know, zombies, right? But the most, the thing that would ding people as being unrealistic because of what they've seen in the rest of pop culture is something where people actually do create some new society right. that doesn't have exploitation, right? Um, and how that is even there is it comes from folks like putting in their movies and films and music just what the problem is here are the problems of capitalism here's what what it is and it ends up making capitalism seem inevitable right that that anything else is so far off and and it makes us get used to the way things are. Like it might seem to be like, oh, you know, it's critical of that, but it doesn't think that you can change anything. And if it does think you can change anything, it's something really vague. Like the problems of capitalism are listed so specifically, might be vague about the analysis of why it's that way, but the problems are listed so specifically and they don't show any pushback against it you know you had uh i always like because i got so incensed when i saw it um which was that movie never let me go um and like the folks are being told that they're just there to be organ donors like and they get sad and then they live with it for a little while and then one of them then, then they decide hey maybe i heard that if we can show that we fall in love, that we can stop it. Now, these are hundreds, maybe thousands of people in England alone in the in the movie. And they and 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 they try to show that they're in love, and then and then they finally do, and then the folks say it doesn't matter, and then they're just sad again and they go off to die. Like there is no fight back, no struggle no movement at all. And in reality, even before all of this year, obviously, there's always movement, there's always organizing, 
we see it around us as writers, we see it around us just in life, but we've been taught to edit that out. That putting that in is somehow unrealistic and, um, and, and uh, not artistic in some way, you know? And meanwhile, we'll put all sorts of other stuff in that obviously just on little things that are really unrealistic, like the, like the 12 o'clock, like the noontime cafe meeting that always happens in a movie, right? Because mm -hmm. they need a place and it's easy to get a location for a cafe that people are like, oh, let's have, or not noontime cafe date. People do have meetings, but like, we're gonna go on a date and we're gonna meet at a cafe. That rarely happens. That rarely happens. People, right? They're not meeting up during that time. It's, if it, it does, I'm not saying it never happened in history, but it happens in every other movie. And no, it doesn't ding us because it happens in every movie. So we accept it as a part of life. Like it must happen, right? But we're not able to put, we edit out like actual struggle and movements that are happening around us out of those things. And that creates a reality for the, for the, the millions and billions of people who watch that culture, right? And, and so one of the reasons that people thought of Sorry to Bother You as being different is because it's one of the few movies that does have labor organizing in it and does have like class struggle. And yeah. I mean, one of the, 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 the plot twist, obviously, of the movie is that of the company Worry Free mutating people into these kinds of horse creatures. Um, and the CEO of the company, Steve Lift, he calls those horse creatures the future of labor, right? And, you know, unlike something like Never Let Me Go, when there, where there is no kind of struggle against it here, there is. Um, I'm curious, though, what you think about the future of labor and how are activists and artists to respond to that? So I always hear a lot of, um, so first of all, I have to say, there's always been a school of writing and thought that basically is, it might be coming from an honest place of the, that this is what these writers think, but basically is always saying, there's nothing we can do about capitalism and we'll tell you how uh, the capitalists have won and that there's, you know, so for instance, there's been articles about robots taking over the workforce since the 60s, right? Not that there aren't robots, they have robots for a long time, but the idea that robots were gonna take over the workforce and, um, and, and somehow mean that there's no way to organize against it. Cause usually it's brought up as like, well, you're saying that this is what we can do. This is how we can, you know, uh, create a, a movement that could withhold labor and stop capitalism and make things happen. But, but what about robots? What about robots? They're just gonna have us on robots and UBI, right? And, um, and so what, what's gonna happen? But the truth is this, the working class is also the market under capitalism, right? So if you had, so, so it doesn't work. If you have the working class and robots, nobody's gonna, and it's just a simple, easy answer to that. That doesn't mean there won't be robots, but at the point where it goes to where now the markets now, now then, then there's no need to make the robots because those companies are now making much less money because they're selling to many to, to a lot less people so you they end up accelerating the crisis of capitalism which is that you know um wages get lower and that and it reduces the market and then they have to raise prices and you know, and it keeps going in that spiral, right? So I think, you know, what do I think about the future of labor? I, I think there will be uh, technological advances, but it will never uh, 
change the fact that the working class has to be people that are also buying the things that are produced. Right. I'm going to turn now to some audience questions from our Q&A function on this webinar. Um, these questions have been selected by the Carsey Wolf staff, and we'll try to get through a number of them right now. Um, and you can continue um, okay. submitting more of your questions. This one question is from Peyton. He says, uh, if you were to write Sorry to Bother You again in 2020, with the changes in attitudes to labor movements and African-American struggles since 2010, how do you think you would write the movie differently? Uh, I don't, I mean, between now and then, I, I don't think I would have, I mean, being that I've seen it now, I have ideas about what would have worked as a scene or something like that, more just more like artistic changes that, I, that but uh, I don't, yeah, I think it's, very applicable now, you know. Yeah. I think it's. I. I don't think I would change it at all. Right. For those. I mean, partly because capitalism continues to be the. Yeah, and it's also even more so right now with like Black Lives Matter. People are looking for ways to, not you know, like we we've had millions of people out on the street this summer, right? People are looking for what that lever is. What's the lever of power that the working class has? Mm -hmm. And this movie points at it, which is the ability for people to collectively withhold labor and stop profit. Uh, because we know that this whole system is, is run by those with, with the wealth and, with, and we can stop the wealth. We, so we have that power. You know? um, another question that I have here is why horses in particular? I mean, they're obviously physically strong, but are there other reasons you chose horses for the transformation at the end? Um, well, yeah, I mean, one, a lot of animals have been taken already. <laughs> but, you know, so there is that part of like, you're always thinking, what can I do differently, right? Two, there needed to be, a, a, but, but, but you're asking, so this question is supposing sm smartly that he did need to go through a transformation. And that part of it was that when he saw, before he went through the transformation, um, when he saw the Equisapiens for the first time, um, he needed to um, see himself, he needed to yeah. see what he was. So. Um, a more efficient uh, creature for profit. And so I think horses are, are culturally, um, we think of them for work, right? There's a small group of horse people that don't, that think of them for riding and jumping over things. But we have it in our culture that's where we, where it's, um, you know, a working, you know, workhorse, mm -hmm. strong as a horse, working like a horse, this or that, you know, um, treating me like a horse or what, you know, um, so, you know, it's already in our culture and was something that was untapped for those reasons. Obviously there's been centaurs or whatever. Um, but that, that is, that was for other reasons. So, you know. So I have two quick questions here as we start wrapping up. Um, one of the questions I have here is from a viewer who wants to know if you can tell us what's on the note cards behind you. Um, the, uh, a couple different movies. That's what I'm, I'll say. Imagine that you can't say more about those yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple different movies. And um, also, uh, no, this is just a couple different movies, but I am also uh, uh, doing a TV show. So these are like just like inspiration things. They won't mean anything to anybody, but they're things that have to do with maybe a color or a pattern or something like that, that I want to be in a certain scene. Um, you know, sometimes it might be a piece of architecture that I want to have or some, or I want something to look like, but basically, you know, to make it interesting for myself. And, you know, again, because the series is themed after subversives, uh, another question asks, what other subversive movies would you recommend? 
mm, Battle of Algiers. Um, that's an easy one. Maitwan. Uh, it's by John Sales. Um, hmm. You know, I have a, a I don't know, I, I, I want some recommendations, you know, but <laughs> because, you know, for lack of, you know, real, like, I mean, obviously, a lots of things are subversive, subversive, you're going to talk about um, uh, Parasite, which is, right. which is a good one, then there's also Snowpiercer. But for the most part, besides a few examples, I think um, folks, when they've made movies, have tried so hard to, uh, you know, not put what they really believe in there. Because, and, and sometimes it's out of this idea of not being, quote, unquote, on the nose. But everything else about filmmaking world is, like, really on the nose. Like, how many James Bond movies that people love are not on the nose about how, you know, the government, you know, the government and the rich people and the the spies are on the side of the a good, and then any other country that we don't know is evil. Like, so you know, might not nobody, you might not ever want to make that kind of a movie, and I understand that. But even on uh, other things like love stories or whatever, like even some of the ones that we think of as the greatest, they still you understand what the story is, what that writer is trying to say about that relationship, right? And people have obscured it so much. Um, that also in that same Walter Murch book, and I got, got to actually uh, uh, confirm it when I met George Lucas. Um, George Lucas, after doing American Graffiti, um, you know, they were in a, a, a kind of a filmmaking collective, George Lucas, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, a few other people. And after he made American Graffiti, which was really popular, one of the most popular movies of that time, um, said, okay, I want to make a movie based on Heart of Darkness, which is, uh, you know, um, and he said, but it, it, and basically Heart of Darkness is what they based, ended up basing Apocalypse Now on. So it was, Apocalypse Now was first going to be his movie. Right. It's going to make I'm going to make a movie based on a heart of darkness, but I want to make the protagonists, the Viet Cong. And that they are going to find someone who became a traitor and started working for the United States and kind of rose up the ranks because of his knowledge of the Viet Cong and all of that kind of stuff. So they're Kurtz was going to be working for the US and they were going to have to go into that territory to get to him. Um, well, even though he had the most pop popular film in a few years, um, made a lot of money, he couldn't raise the money for that, his, his version of Apocalypse Now, which was that, uh, because they said it was it's too radical. Like you are actually having the moral people be, um, the moral people be be a calm, be communists. So we're you're not going to get that funded. And he was like, okay, how about if I make the same story in space? And that's where the original Star Wars came from. Now, in his mind, that was a subversive movie. Like it, but it's so obs purposely obscured what it is that it's a movie that probably also influenced people to join wars, you know, uh, on, on the side of the United States, right? It, uh, and, and, and it's also like one of the biggest pieces of culture in the history of humankind. And it still got that message to very few people Right, because people because because of it, what he did was what everybody did. Like a lot of people, only if you're a Trekkie do you know that in Star Trek they have a socialist society, right? 
Um, and you know, most, but, but billions of people have watched that and not gotten anything useful about what they should do about the world in it. So there are a lot of things that we can say are subversive. If Star Wars subversive, maybe. Is Star Trek subversive? Maybe. Um, there are all these things. But I think we need something in which people are really talking about what we can do to change things. Because I don't think it's subversive just to talk about the how bad things are. At maybe one point in history, it was. Or if we were under uh, you know, extreme fascism where nobody got to say anything bad about the way things are, then um, that might be an act of defiance. But, um, you know, you know, once, you know, McDonald's can do Black Lives Matter, you know, um, commercials, then saying what things are wrong is not necessarily subversive in and of itself. Saying, talking about methods for changing the system, for getting rid of this system, um, and talk and, and, and encouraging, put it like this, encouraging people to join those movements at the very least. You know, that I think that needs to be the new level of subversive. But I would put like Meituan into that category. Um, it's very much a cheerleader for militant strikes. Um, somebody said nine to five. Um, again, I love that movie just on the question of is it subversive or not? I think it pushes like a certain, you know, disdain for management or whatever, but I don't know. Harlan yeah. County, USA, that's one of my favorites. Huh? Harlan County, USA, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I'm not saying that, that because I didn't name them, they're not there. I just often, often, I will think about it later tonight and be like, well, thank you again, Boots, for sitting down with us this evening, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it was great to have you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody.